I'm Natalie Emmanuel. Today we'll turn our time machine back 40 years to meet a controversial woman who studied chemistry at Oxford University and rose through the ranks to become the United Kingdom's first female prime minister. Margaret Thatcher came to power during the Cold War and led Britain in a war with Argentina for control of a group of islands in the southern Atlantic Ocean. She's the last female head of government to lead her nation into a major war, and her uncompromising approach earned her the nickname the Iron Lady. Here to talk about my home country in a time of punk rock, the Irish Republican Army, labour strikes and the evil empire are the daughter-father team of Emily and Jonathan Jordan. Hey Natalie, it is so great to see you. It's great to see you both again too. Natalie, you were born just before the end of the Thatcher government, so... You probably don't remember much about her time in power, but your family probably had some thoughts. Growing up, what did your mom tell you about Margaret Thatcher and her government? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably not great. Yeah, it wasn't exactly positive. I just remember the like introduction of something called the poll tax, which was not received very well. And like, <laughs> you know, people talk about her as not very well and she wasn't very well liked and definitely not in my family mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. sure. as like working class people people of color like you know she had a very like allegedly a very divide and conquer um sort of uh, approach to you know civil rights of you know black and brown people and you know the labor unions and things like that it was a very kind of tough tough time and yeah um yeah. <laughs> a lot of my friends from the UK who come from working class families, that's that's their image that sort of set in time. But it's it's interesting the different perspectives you get on different sides of the ocean. A leader sometimes is viewed differently at home than they are outside their country. And I remember during the 80s that uh, Margaret Thatcher and Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev were very popular in the United States. But in their home countries, they were deeply unpopular. Mm. Yeah, Thatcher was a mixed bag, certainly. <laughs> Love her or hate her. She, I mean, she was ready to fight for what she believed in. A lot of people hated her for her domestic policies, while others saw no alternative to her policies. She took power to change things at home, but she found herself confronted with a war she never expected, the kind of war you might see during Queen Victoria's reign. So, John, why don't you take us through the story of Margaret Thatcher and the Falklands War? Our story begins during World War II with a young grocer's daughter named Margaret Roberts. She was a middle-class teenager during the Second World War when German bombers pounded Britain during the Blitz. Britain's Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, took to the airwaves with defiant speeches vowing to fight no matter how long or how painful the cost. His fight on the beaches and finest hour speeches electrified the British public, and that public included a young Margaret Roberts. And we've seen other examples of women like Katerina Sforza who are really inspired by political figures from the past. Right. Now, even though Margaret pursued chemistry as her major in college, she had this strong sense of history and the past and politics, and it all kind of blended together. Yeah, and she studied at Oxford, correct? Yeah, she went to Somerville College. Now, that was a women's college, uh, the same college that Indira Gandhi studied at in the 1930s. Um, she got into conservative politics in college, and she became president of the Oxford University Conservative Association. Now, that was a kind of debating society which covered issues that faced Great Britain at the time. So she grew up with the inspiration of Winston Churchill and believing in the old-fashioned idea of British exceptionalism. And we see a lot of women in the War Queens who were very patriotic, and a lot of them actually came from democratically elected forms of government. Uh, Gandhi and Golda Meir. Yeah, those are good examples. And uh, Margaret Roberts was certainly a patriot. She went to law school, and in 1950, she ran for parliament as a conservative in Dartford, a working class neighborhood that uh, was really a labor party, the opposition party's stronghold. Here's a fun fact, Em. One of Margaret Roberts' conservative party supporters in Dartford was the mother of Mick Jagger. Who, oh, no of course, way. Yeah, yeah, that, 
the Rolling Stones lead singer. He grew up to be a rock and roller who symbolized the opposition to the establishment that Margaret Roberts stood for. So Maggie Roberts becomes Margaret Thatcher by marrying a World War II veteran. They would go on to have two children, twins, and Thatcher was one of a really very few war queens who had a stable long-term marriage. And uh, Queen Tamar did that as well, but very few other women that we talk about kept successful marital bonds uh, while maintaining power. So true. A lot of these women wrap their lives around power and politics, and when a war breaks out, you just don't have a whole lot of time left to sustain a marriage. So very few made it, but uh, Thatcher was one marriage that lasted. So she's married. Uh, what comes next for her? She won her first election in 1959 after uh, three successive losses, and she became a Conservative Party candidate from Finchley, which is a prosperous North London suburb. Thatcher spent the next 20 years climbing her way up the Conservative Party ladder and became the Education Secretary in the government in 1970. Well, five years later, the conservatives lost their majority in parliament, so she and her conservatives got thrown out of government. But she was elected head of the conservative party in opposition. So let's pause here real quick, because mm -hmm. here in America, the president is uh, selected separately from Congress. Uh, but with parliament, the party with the most seats um, in the parliament gets to select their leader. So if you control parliament, you get to pick the prime minister. That's a good summary. Uh, but Margaret Thatcher climbed the ladder not just by being a, a party person. Uh, she certainly didn't get there through being an in-your-face feminist or some kind of man basher. She was a very hard worker. She had an extremely smart almost scientific mind. In conferences and in cabinet meetings, if you didn't know your stuff thoroughly, if you didn't have all the facts, she would call you out. Uh, she also had a pretty easy way of getting along with the men in government, and uh, she wouldn't mind uh, enjoying a glass of whiskey after hours or laughing at an off-color joke uh, with the boys. So one of Thatcher's first overseas trips actually was across the world to go meet Indira Gandhi in India. The two were from opposite ends of the political spectrum. We have one middle-class conservative and a Brahmin anti-colonialist, but they really liked each other. Margaret Thatcher learned from Indira's example, and they were both very confident, strong, capable women. And we don't see many times where the women in our book actually get to meet each other, especially ones from such polarizing ends of the political spectrum. Sure. Um, and they would meet a few times, and, and Thatcher drew inspiration from Indira Gandhi. Uh, she also met Golda Meir at a different point. Uh, there's a picture in our book, The War Queens, of two, the two women meeting in the 1970s, and then they met later when Thatcher was the British Prime Minister, and eventually uh, Thatcher traveled to India to lay a wreath at Indira's funeral. So she was quite an inspiration to her. But in British politics, Margaret Thatcher took a lot of criticism that men would not get. She really did. French President Francois Mitterrand said that Thatcher had the eyes of Stalin and the voice of Marilyn Monroe. One Liberal Party member called her Attila the Hen because she carried her purse around and sometimes pulled out notes to use to bludgeon other cabinet members with facts. Political commentators coined the term handbagging to describe her throwing down on friends and opponents. And just like Indira Gandhi and just like Golda Meir, she had to endure the old best man in the cabinet uh, comments, which had kind of grown stale even back when Indira was a cabinet minister decades before. Thatcher also used her feminine qualities to set her apart from these politicians. She was very, very precise about her makeup. Clinique was her favorite brand, and her and her personal assistant would pore over Vogue and just try to pick out the best fashion tips that could really present this image of a strong, put-together woman. Um, so instead of wearing the flower pattern dresses of the time, she wanted to wear a power suit and she used plenty of hairspray to keep her blonde hair perfect to kind of just put on this armor to present in front of the people. Her and her personal assistant actually worked together to make kind of a code uh, for her wardrobe. So there would be my conference blue and Gdansk green, and they would use these to kind of plan and prepare for meetings. A clothing expert from Christie's called her the ultimate power dresser, and she took voice coaching from Sir Lawrence Olivier. 
Yep, uh, she was remaking her image. And all of this image remaking and her political philosophy came together in 1979. That's what the British papers called the winter of discontent. This was a time of high inflation, high crime, punk rock, the decline of the British Empire, and middle class voters wanted a change. So in 1979, they voted in the Conservative Party, and that meant that Margaret Thatcher became Britain's first female prime minister. Well, as prime minister, Margaret Thatcher wanted to focus on problems at home. She began cutting taxes and cutting government spending. And that meant that traditional industries like the coal and steel industries were very badly hurt. Three million Britons were thrown out of work. Small businesses began to sink. The stock market went into a dive and her approval rating hit a record low. Before too long, there would be labor strikes and artists like Sting and Pink Floyd would record songs blasting Thatcher's domestic policies. I know Natalie talks about this lasting um, legacy of how hurt the working class were and, and how people just hated her for it. Absolutely. Yeah, there, there was a lot of hate given at Margaret Thatcher, and it's sort of different to see her, her perceptions on different sides of the Atlantic Ocean. But uh, yeah, but Natalie's point about how the working class was disproportionately hurt by the Thatcher economics is something that still resonates today, and there's still a lot of, of anger in a lot of quarters. Understandably. Well, closer to home, the Irish Republican Army stepped up its domestic terrorism campaign. A few months after Margaret Thatcher's election, they assassinated Lord Louis Mountbatten, Queen Elizabeth's distant cousin. I think he appears in the TV series The Crown. Um, and some IRA prisoners held in British jails held a hunger strike to protest their treatment as criminals. The press and world leaders like the Pope put a lot of pressure on Thatcher to give in to their demands and treat them like political prisoners, but she refused. It was a matter of principle that Northern Ireland was British until the Northern Irish voted to leave the British uh, Kingdom. And after a few strikers died of hunger, the IRA backed down. So, Dad, you grew up during the time of Reagan over here in America. How did us Americans see Thatcher? Americans saw her as kind of like the other side of Ronald Reagan, and America, just like Britain, was changing. A year and a half after Thatcher was elected, Ronald Reagan was elected on a wave of small government, free market conservatism, just like Thatcher was. And Reagan and Margaret Thatcher actually became pretty good friends. They referred to each other as Ron and Margaret in their correspondence, and both were ardent anti-communists who saw the Soviet Union as the free world's greatest enemy. Uh, Reagan coined the term evil empire to describe them. Thatcher was such a hard anti-communist that the Soviet papers called her the Iron Lady, which she actually took as a compliment. Yeah, that was kind of a good way she flipped their narrative, and she wore that as a, uh, as a badge of honor. I think Reagan and Thatcher saw themselves as the heirs to the special relationship that started with Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill during World War II. That sort of implied that the Soviet Union was like Nazi Germany in the 1940s narrative. So Reagan and Thatcher began working on ways to build up their nuclear arsenals to potentially fight World War III. What she didn't expect was a war for one of Britain's uh, few remaining colonies. Yeah, um, I think that's fair. That's that's where Margaret Thatcher, the domestic economic reformer, the uh, the science major in college, became this war queen, or I guess more accurately, a war prime minister. Three hundred miles off the Argentine coast. In the Southern Atlantic, there's a group of islands called the Falkland Islands. It's got basically two big islands and then some smaller ones. The Falkland Islands had belonged to Great Britain since 1833. It had about 1,820 people and tens of thousands of sheep. It's basically just a rocky place for sheep herding. Uh, Margaret Thatcher's husband called it miles and miles of bugger all. And since the Panama Canal was opened, the Falkland Islands had not been very useful strategically to the British Empire. 
But the inhabitants on the Falklands wanted to remain part of Britain. They were overwhelmingly ethnic Britons, and they lobbied Parliament to make sure the British government would protect them if Argentina tried to invade. Well, in early 1982, Argentina was ruled by a military junta led by Army General Leopold Galtieri and the heads of the Air Force and Navy. The Argentine economy was collapsing and the public was angry at the junta. So they had to find a way to unite the public, the Argentine public, behind the government. And throughout history, we see a lot of leaders in kind of their pride and avarice use war as a way to unite the people. I mean, we see this with the Greeks. Uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, when you've got a fractious group, they do come together to uh, to deal with a common enemy, and that's what happened. Well, Galtieri and the Junta saw the Falkland Islands, which they called Las Malvinas, as a, an easy target. Since World War II, Britain had given up its, its colonial possessions in India, in Palestine, in Egypt, in Rhodesia, and a lot of other places. Thatcher was cutting Britain's military budget. And besides, around June 1982, that's going to be the winter in the Southern Hemisphere. So the winter storms would begin, making military operations nearly impossible. Well, in March of that year, the Argentines landed a handful of civilian contractors on the island of South Georgia. Thatcher didn't want to start a war, so she did nothing, and the junta moved a detachment of Marines onto that little island. Then they anchored two missile ships off the island. Well, the British did nothing, but Thatcher was worried, so she ordered the Defense Ministry to begin contingent planning for invading South Georgia in case the Argentines refused to leave. But her ministry officials told her there wasn't much they could do. The islands were nearly 8,000 miles away, and Argentina's Navy had an aircraft carrier, four submarines, and five marine battalions that could invade other islands. The British had a very small contingent of Royal Marines on one of the Falkland Islands, and that's all they had to oppose them. Well, at the end of March, the British Embassy in Buenos Aires reported that a naval squadron from Argentina was heading toward the Falkland Islands. What do you think Margaret Thatcher was thinking at the time? You know, she had a few choices. Uh, she could back down, which is what previous governments probably would have done, or she could fight to recapture them. She couldn't prevent their capture. And if she backed down, it would have been a national disaster and proof to the world that Great Britain couldn't even stand up to a South American dictatorship. But her ministers were telling her that if Argentina did invade, it would be next to impossible to get enough ships, airplanes, and troops 8,000 miles to the south to drive the invaders off the islands. On the last day of March, she called in her advisors, they're all men, and they told her she could not recapture the islands if they were invaded. She later called that the worst moment of my life, and she looked at the men sitting before her and said, if they are invaded, we have to get them back. Well, as she was trying to persuade her defense minister, a guy with big glasses named Sir John Knott, to figure out a way to fight for the Falklands, an admiral arrived late for the conference. His name was Admiral Sir Henry Leach, and he told her that Britain could recapture the islands. It would take three weeks for the ships to get there, and they would need luck with the weather. But they could thread the needle, so Margaret Thatcher ordered her defense ministry to form a small task force and get ready to sail. At this point, they needed a contingency plan. Uh, the military is always making up plans, um, but usually there's not a lot that actually get carried out. Yeah, you, you make plans for everything in, in military circles, and, and you rarely use them. Uh, she had hoped in this case that she could send the fleet down to the Falklands, but it would take three weeks to get there so she could use diplomacy in the meantime to get the junta to turn back. But the Argentine government did not. And in the early morning of April 2nd, the Argentines launched Operation Rosario, the invasion of the Falkland Islands. Now, once they landed on the Falklands, they took them over very quickly. And it was Thatcher's first job to voice the outrage Britons felt at having their lands invaded by a foreign power. Here, Margaret Thatcher channeled Winston Churchill. She used to keep copies of his speeches with her, and she knew there was no better wartime mentor than Churchill. She stood before the British Parliament and declared that the Falklanders were British subjects, and until they voted to leave the United Kingdom, it was, she said, the duty of the British people 
and the duty of Her Majesty's government to do everything we can to uphold their right to live in peace. So the day after her speech, the vanguard of a British task force weighed anchor at Portsmouth and began their three-week journey to the Falkland Islands. Margaret Thatcher was unafraid to fight over principle, but she had no military training and found herself sending the Royal Navy to a war 8,000 miles away. We'll hear more about how Thatcher learned the art of war after we come back from our break. All right, Dad, so the Argentines were not going to back down and they invaded the Falkland Islands. Retaking the Falkland Islands would be a logistical nightmare. I mean, they would need over 100 ships to supply the 25,000 men they had. That's right. Now, in Buenos Aires, General Galtieri thought that Britain would not go through all the trouble to retake the islands. He told a U.S. military envoy that that woman, as he called her, wouldn't dare go to war. Now, the U.S. envoy said he wasn't so sure. In Spanish, he replied, That woman has let a number of hunger strikers of her own basic ethnic origin starve themselves to death without batting an eyelash. I wouldn't count on that if I were you. Well, back in London, Margaret Thatcher knew that she was in over her head on military matters. She couldn't even find the Falkland Islands on a map when shown to her. But she stuck to the political matters and let the military professionals do their jobs. And we see in her memoir, she lays out a really clear explanation of what the national Mm -hmm. leader should do. She actually wrote, The rules of engagement are the means by which the politicians authorize the framework within which the military can be left to make the operational decisions. They have to satisfy the objectives for which a particular military operation is undertaken. They must also give the man on the spot reasonable freedom to react as is required and to make his decisions knowing that they will be supported by the politicians. You know, one ironic advantage that many of the women in our book had is that they didn't know anything about military operations. I mean, you've heard the expression, I know enough to be dangerous. Most of the women in our book did not know enough to be dangerous, and that helped them stay in their lane when it came to politics and big decisions, which they made, and then the smaller decisions about military battles, which they left to the professionals. Yeah, you have to know what you don't know. Uh, We learn about that a lot in medicine. You have to know your scope of practice. You have to know where to ask for help. Mm -hmm. Her husband, Dennis Thatcher, said she wouldn't have done it if she had been a man and if she'd been in the armed forces during the war. Then she'd have been aware of how dreadfully wrong everything was likely to go. That's right. And Margaret Thatcher was surrounded by World War II veterans who were extremely cautious for the very reason that Dennis Thatcher mentioned. They had the experience of war and they knew how bloody and nasty and wrong it can go. And Thatcher had touted her amazing relationship with America. Where were they when they needed help? Well, the uh, the United States did not come around to fulfill the the special relationship in the way Thatcher thought they should at the beginning. Remember, part of America, the, the Reagan administration's concern was communism. And they were worried that in Central and South America, the communists were going to infiltrate our hemisphere. Reagan's advisors were divided. Some of them said, it's better not to side with Britain because we'll anger the Latin American countries and give an opening to the communists. And then others said, we need to adhere to the special relationship. So after a little while, the United States uh, came around. We sent over a secretary of state, Alexander Haig, who did some talking to Margaret Thatcher and came away writing back to the White House. She's not giving up. So let's go in and support her. And before long, the U.S. military came around. We started sending more replacement weapons and giving British satellite and other intelligence information, kind of like we're doing with Ukraine in the year 2022. Yes, she was definitely very ardent about taking this on. Uh, So what's going on on the battlefront, Dad? Okay, so a British task force makes it there by late April. And on the 25th of April, Marines took back South Georgia. A week later, 
Thatcher received a submarine report that the Argentine missile cruiser General Belgrano was just outside a 200-mile exclusionary zone that Britain declared to be the combat front. Thatcher knew that if she had the submarine attack the cruiser Belgrano, it would be seen as widening the war and drawing kind of a first blood. But she wasn't going to let the Argentines sink one of her ships, so she said they must attack, and her war cabinet agreed. So the submarine sank the General Belgrano, sending 321 Argentine sailors to the bottom of the Atlantic with it. Well, after that, Argentina's Navy didn't want to sail into the battlefront. But an Argentine plane sent a missile into the British destroyer Sheffield, killing 21 British crewmen. And that was the first British warship to be lost to enemy fire since the Second World War. And a number of other attacks from airplanes damaged other warships, killing more British sailors. And Thatcher took these losses incredibly personally. She did. Um, I remember reading that she wrote letters to the families of servicemen who were killed in this war, and she would go to visit the sailors who were wounded and the Marines in the hospitals. Yeah, yeah. At the end, um, she wrote all 255 letters. And from what I've read about military commanders through the centuries, one of the hardest things to do is visit wounded soldiers in the hospital. Uh, General George Patton, as tough a soldier as ever was, used to cry over the death of some of his men. Uh, your grandfather, who was an Air Force transport pilot during the Vietnam War, used to go back and visit wounded men he was flying out of Saigon back to Japan or the United States. And that was very, very hard on Pawpaw. She still didn't want to back down, though. Having considered diplomacy, logistics, and the military picture, she thought she had a path to victory. Natalie? Modern warfare is a complicated business. Today's war queens have to balance allies, economics, weaponry, and logistics, sometimes on the other side of the planet. After the break, we'll hear about how Margaret Thatcher navigated these challenges during the Falklands War. On May 21, 1982, the Royal Navy fleet made it to the Falkland Islands and began landing Marines, paratroopers, and commandos onto the beaches of the main island, East Falkland. For a few days, they were pounded by U.S.-made aircraft being flown by Argentine pilots. But Argentina's Navy did not do a whole lot, and the British paratroopers were able to march overland toward the capital city of Port Stanley. It must have been really difficult to resist the urge to call her forward commanders and say, what are you doing? What is going on? Yeah, that's one of the tough parts of this job, I think. It's once you launch an operation, once you set things in motion, you have to let them play out. And it's very difficult to fidget there, but that's just something you have to do. Dwight Eisenhower talked about that often. But that's why the British professionals were able to do their job so well, even when they didn't have enough air cover, they didn't have enough transportation. Um, they got to do their jobs the best way they saw. The paratroopers took a key defensive point called Goose Green, and they moved toward Port Stanley. All the while, other countries and uh, Pope John Paul II were urging her to end the war and let a commission or a mediator settle things in some kind of compromise, maybe you know, transitioning over to Argentine rule or, or joint rule. Uh, soon, but Thatcher would have nothing to do with that. She called that snatching diplomatic defeat from the jaws of military victory. Thatcher called Ronald Reagan and said, uh, we're going in, we're gonna take back the islands. And Reagan told Thatcher, now, Margaret, I, I don't think that that's something you should do. And she said, Ron, what would happen if someone invaded Alaska and we sent all these troops out there and you're telling me that we should turn around and go back? And Ronald Reagan said, well, Margaret, I don't think that's the same thing. And she said, it really is. And she said she wasn't, gonna, wasn't going to, uh, to back down. And eventually Reagan said, well, Margaret, uh, thanks. I know that I've bothered you. And she said, oh, no, nothing, nothing wrong with that at all. Thank you very much. Cheerio. And hung up the phone. Yeah, it's definitely difficult optics, I, but I, I kind of agree with Reagan looking at it. You know, this is a 
perspective of colonialism, um, which I guess Alaska in some ways was as well, but mm -hmm. it does feel different. Yeah, it, it seems like it. It's, it's farther away. And uh, remember, it's not us. When it's somebody else's land, it's always easy to say, you should give up, let's make peace. Uh, Reagan called it getting the two brawlers out of the bar room. Well, the Argentine Air Force continued to attack British ships, killing and wounding a couple hundred more sailors. But on June 14, two and a half months after the invasion, Port Stanley's 5,000 Argentine soldiers surrendered. And this victory would really come to change um, the government. But I want to talk about the real impact of the Falkland Wars, which is something I read about in a BBC article. There is a species of penguins in the Falkland Islands. Stay with me here. Okay. I have a point. All right. Yeah, there are lots of penguins in the Falklands. Yes. And, and they were doing okay, kind of being overpreyed upon. But the impact of this war that I think is so important is that... During this war, they laid all these landmines out, and the penguins are actually light enough not to trip it, but their natural predators would trip the landmines. And so because of this war, there is a thriving population of Falkland penguins, which I think is, is the only silver lining That's we can hilarious. take away. Can you, can you imagine, that, that would be a good, what that would be like as an Attenborough film, nature film, like here we see the Falklands hyena creeping up on a nest of, of small penguins. They don't see it. He's about to get a <laughs> Yes. And then, then Attenborough would say, I don't even know why I do these things. Once again, man destroys nature. All right, let's wrap up here. I remember her defense secretary, John Knott, said she had a woman's courage, which is different from a man's courage. Yeah, um, he said she had more courage and obstinacy than a man did. And he said she shut her mind to the risks of conducting an adventure 8,000 miles away. The defense secretary summed it up this way. It was a woman's war and the woman in her won. And the woman would continue to run Britain until 1990. So, Dad, how would you rank Margaret Thatcher? I think I would probably give her medium to high marks. Obviously, she won. It was uh, kind of a mess. I'd probably give her about an eight and a half. You know, she let the Argentines get the jump on her. She had cut her military budgets and left Britain in a vulnerable position. And she was thinking about World War III with the evil empire rather than a small war like this. So she loses points for that. She does get points for determination. Uh, again, you know, a lot of people have very strong and negative feelings about her over her yeah. domestic policies. But, very valid feelings. But her popularity did shoot up when uh, Britain won. I mean, we like winners. Natalie, any last thoughts to take us home? As we talked about at the beginning of our show, Margaret Thatcher was a woman of principle and she was willing to fight for what she thought was right even when it harmed lots of people. But by 1982, wars had become complex matters where the superpowers, the United Nations and regional political groups played a part just as much as the Argentines and British would. It reminds us that war is never simple and leaders, whether men or women, have to balance principle against the realities of global politics. We hope you enjoyed this episode of War Queens. That's our show for today. Listen to every episode of War Queens for more stories of women who brought their nations through the fires of war. If you have any questions for us about War Queens, if you're curious about something you heard on the show, we'd love to hear from you. Please email us at warqueens at diversionaudio.com. Again, that's warqueens at diversionaudio.com. We'll try to answer your questions on a future episode. Find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at War Queens Podcast. War Queens is a production of Diversion Audio. Your hosts are John Jordan, Emily Jordan, and I'm Natalie Emmanuel. The show is written by John and Emily Jordan based on their book, The War Queens. Our supervising producer and sound designer is Mark Francis. With production assistance from Antonio Enriquez. Editorial direction from Jacob Bronstein and Scott Waxman. Our head of marketing is Erica Farmer. Our theme music is by Tyler Cash. 
Executive producers, Jacob Bronstein, Mark Francis, and Scott Waxman for Diversion Audio. 